Oh, bless the name of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We pour out our hearts in worship and praise to an, to an almighty God. I don't know about you, but I'm excited uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ today. Uh, I heard the psalmist declare, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O Mount Vernon, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I declare God is worthy to be praised. Have I got about three or four of y'all that don't mind clapping your hands right into here and opening up your mouth and declaring with me, what a mighty God we serve. I don't know about you. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on him. And I'm so glad to report because he is my shelter, because he is my buckler, because he is my defense, I shall not, I will not, I cannot be defeated. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom the Lord has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Have I got about three or four of y'all that can testify that you've been redeemed? Can you sing this morning the song, hymn number 338, redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by by the blood of the lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. I'm excited this morning to be coming to you with the word of God. I'm excited to be a man on the pastoral team of the Mount Vernon Seventh-day Adventist Church where my senior pastor is Pastor Pierre Eddie Laguerre, a powerful man of God. Man of God, we um, continue to extend to you a words of condolence on the passing of your stepmother. Uh, we know that she was a valiant warrior for the Lord and that she is resting in Jesus. And soon and very soon, uh, she's going to hear the trump as you preached the other night, and she will be risen to life everlasting. Again, I want to thank you, amen, for the privilege and the honor of serving you here at the Mount Vernon Church. And to my church family, hey, I love you. I love you. I love you you. That having been said, let's get to the word. There is a word preserved for us today in the book of Acts and the third chapter. Acts chapter three, verses one to eight. I want you to get that word in your hand right here and right now as we turn, amen, our attention to the sermonic text. Acts chapter three, verses one to eight. Acts three, verses one to eight. And the Bible reads thusly now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain lame, a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they daily laid at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked them an alms. And Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John said, look on us, and he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. The Bible goes on to read, then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, and lifted him up. And the Bible says, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Verse eight, and he leaping stood up and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. I'd like to preach this afternoon from this word and with this thought in our minds, not a hand out, but a hand up. Uh, Sister, Sister Linton, will you look at your awesome husband and tell him, not a hand out, uh, but a hand up. Uh, Pastor Laguerre, go ahead and, and look at your beautiful wife and tell her, uh, it's not a hand out, but it's a hand up. Will you pray with me, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise, honor, and glory. And our prayer is simple today. Magnify yourself through the preaching of the word. 
so that your name will be glorified. The saints will be edified and the devil will be horrified. In Jesus' name, amen. We run into Peter and John at the ninth hour and the Bible says they're on their way to the temple. They've arrived at the gate called Beautiful. And that's where they come across a lame man who is brought daily to the gate to beg for money. Elder Davis, it's a prime spot, a place where people worship the God of heaven and earth. It's a place where money flows freely. It's a place with a reputation for supernatural displays of God's power. And seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, our lame man calls out to them. With raised voice, he cries out, Sister Myrie, alms, alms, alms. He's begging for money. What amazes me, church, is the fact that this man, disheveled and despondent and decrepit, would find permanent residence at the temple gates. Why is it, Elder Davis, that in the place where the people of God hang out and where the Spirit of God is supposedly moving, that this lame man has remained for so long? The Bible does not tell us, but I'd like to suggest the following. The people in the temple are so accustomed to seeing people go through hard times that it no longer affects them. They become desensitized to the poverty all around them. And church, what scares me today is that we, modern day Israel, can at times get so comfortable in our temple procedures, so comfortable in our church rituals that we don't realize what's going on in the streets around us. At times, we've been so busy praising God and preaching the second coming and pushing church doctrine and concern with worship, praise, and preaching so heavenly-minded that we have failed to be of earthly good. And the problem with the Israelites both then and now uh, is a lack of focus on social consciousness. And so, Pastor Laguerre, the man is at the temple gate. He's still at the gate, ladies and gentlemen, because... Temple goers misunderstood that true worship is not just what you do in the worship service, but it's how you live in your everyday life. Uh, they were sacrificing animals, uh, but they were not offering up their lives. And because they valued religiosity over spirituality, they could not understand that true worship and ministry is what you do after the amen has been said and after the closing hymn has been offered and after the benediction has been rendered. And so the lame man is still at the gate. And after a while, something begins to happen to the lame man because, JJ, there was a time when the temple gate was a place of hope and healing, but now the gate represents sickness and suffering. Our beggar is no longer concerned with being healed, Elder Davis. He's so disappointed by his encounters with the people of God that he's given up on them. Uh, you see, at first he went to the temple expecting a cure. He had heard testimonies about temple healings in his weekly support group, but day after day and month after month and maybe year after year, this man goes to the temple unchanged and unhealed. In church, they make a whole lot of noise at the temple, but they ain't got no power at the temple. And so the beggar finally says to, themse to himself, they can't change me, uh, but maybe they can give me some change. Uh, he's no longer looking for healing in his body. Now all he wants, Elder Desmond, is change in his cup. Uh, he's lowered his expectation. And what's even more sad is that some of the people going into the temple don't give him a dime. They ignored him. They stepped over him. They walked around him. And I even believe some of them trampled upon him on their way to the temple courts. 
But this afternoon, he encounters Peter and John. He sees the two men of God going towards the temple and the beggar cries out, Alms! 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 He's looking for some money. He's looking for some noise in his cup. Elder Davis, the beggar, does not know it yet, but his life is about to take a turn right here because unlike the people who typically come to worship, Peter and John hear the beggar. His voice matters to them. Their ears hear his cries. And not only do they hear him, but the text tells us they see him. Church, he's hard to look at. The kind of man that makes your skin itch and your blood chill. But the Bible says they look at him. They examine his situation. Peter and John immerse themselves and are invested in the plight of this marginalized man. They realize that this opportunity cannot be overlooked. And ladies and gentlemen, on this 30th day of May, on this Sabbath morning, better yet, on this day of worship, this holy day unto the Lord, I'm hard pressed to let this opportunity pass by without making necessary observations about what must now be the hottest topic in the country and maybe even the world. George Floyd is dead, murdered in broad daylight, murdered by a callous and cold-blooded killer dressed in a policeman's uniform. He pled for his life and uttered the now famous words of Eric Gardner, I can't breathe. And the former officer, the deplorable Derek Chauvin, sat on his neck until the dearly detained became the dearly departed. And listen to me. As angry as I am about a system that continues to allow paid civil servants sworn to protect and serve who we remunerate with our tax dollars to continue to execute us with impunity. I am today even more incensed about the fact that many in Christendom, especially of the lighter persuasion, yea, even the highest levels of church administration either make pity and ambiguous statements to this tragedy or none at all. I'm hard to believe, I'm hard pressed to believe that were Jesus to walk among us today, that he would have adopted this posture of indifference that seems to plague evangelical Christianity. I am comfortable today to assert that the gospel of Jesus is a gospel of justice, which includes uh, its social manifestations as well. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll do well to remember the words of Jesus' inaugural sermon the first one that he ever preached to kick off his ministry, Luke 4, 18 and 19, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, the Bible says, and hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I dare say, Mount Vernon, that Jesus could not and would not allow those within the sphere of his ministry to remain unattended and their cries to go unanswered. He believed that it was his mission to hear them, to identify with them, and to rescue them. And to those of us who claim Jesus as Lord, amen, we cannot be expected to do any less. And so I say this, amen, unreservedly and unashamedly, shame on any believer who's comfortable to remain silent and disengaged in these perilous times. And parenthetically, I reject as a true Seventh-day Adventist the pie-in-the-sky theology preached by some believers that asserts that these are the last and evil days and these things are a sign of the Lord's coming 
just so that they can abdicate their responsibility to minister to the least of these. I declare today that those who would pray that God's kingdom would come and that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven and then sit idly by as workers of iniquity and proponents of the kingdom of darkness engage in their work unimpeded are nothing more than whitewashed sepulchers filled with dead men's bones. If the strength and the serenity of your worship is nothing more than voluminous ramblings meant to anesthetize your conscience to the need to say something and do something about the madness going on in the world. I'd like to speak on behalf of Jesus. Revelation 3.16. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Today, church, it's George Floyd. Today, it's Philando Castile. Today, it's Alton Sterling. Today, it's Sandra Bland. Today, it's Breonna Taylor. Today, it's Tamir Rice. Today, it's Eddie, Eric Gardner. But tomorrow, it could be Eddie Laguerre. Tomorrow, it could be Darrell Hall. Tomorrow, it could be Kevin Anderson or Gary Saunders or Desmond Thompson. Tomorrow, God help us, it could be Pastor Greg Nelson. And the people of God, I declare on this Sabbath that we need to take time to listen to those who are hurting around us. We need to invest and engage in the plight of those who are less fortunate. I know especially in this COVID-19 pandemic that we'd rather hunker down, sit in our homes and not see them and hear them, but there they are, the dispossessed, the disenfranchised and disheartened, the distressed and displaced and discouraged, the disavowed and the dismissed. Parenthetically, let me pause right here to affirm the ministry, amen, of Sister Myrie and those who are laboring to continue to feed members in the community. This, I believe, is what the Lord Jesus would have us to be doing, even in these hard and turbulent times. I affirm your ministry because we cannot just remain isolated God is waiting for us to be about the work of the kingdom, to recognize those who have fallen down, to recognize those who are disenfranchised. They need to hear from us and not just handing them a track, not just telling them that Jesus is coming. We ought to be on the front lines protesting and calling for justice. We've been asking God to save them and heal them and deliver them. And I hear God saying, I've already provided for them because I gave them you. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to Peter acknowledging the man's want. Silver and gold have I none. Desmond, if Peter was speaking street talk, he would have said, I hear you, my brother. I'm feeling you, my G. I got you. I hear what you're asking for. But, but I don't have what you want. But he, he, listen, listen, he says, silver and gold have I none but such as I do have. Uh, in other words, ladies and gentlemen, Peter did not have what the man wanted, but it did not stop him from ministering to the man. He said, but such as I do have. In other words, Peter was saying, I may not have what you want, but I'll give you all I've got. Peter doesn't have financial resources, church, but he's rich in the power of the spirit. And I guess what I'm trying to tell you here today is no matter what you might not have, God has given everybody something that you can use to help build up the kingdom. Peter ain't got no money, but he's got an anointing. He's got a relationship that gives him spiritual authority. God gave him the right to access all of the power of heaven in the name of Jesus. In other words, Peter has been given authority over satanic forces. He's been given authority over demonic influences. He's been given authority over principalities and powers. He's even been given authority over sickness and disease. He speaks to the man church in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Rise up and walk around. He declares the word of God over him and calls the power of Jesus to move in his life. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter 
is simple enough, unsophisticated enough, and learned, unlearned enough to believe that there's power in the name of Jesus. Listen to Peter as he boldly accesses the power of God in the name. Ugh, I, I feel like preaching right there. Listen, when you got a relationship, uh, uh, Brother Linton, you have access and authority to speak that name. He said, not in the name of Allah, not in the name of Buddha, not in the name of Confucius, uh, but in the name of Jesus, uh, rise up and walk. Oh, don't just stop there at what Peter said, because if you do, you'll miss an important step in Peter and John's evangelistic method because Acts 3, 7 says, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. I'm coming down your street in a minute. The Bible teaches us that Peter did not just resort to speaking. He didn't just give the man a tract, uh, but the word tells us he stooped down to where the man was sitting. He extended his hand, Pastor Laguerre, and he picked the man up in Peter's touch. We have a biblical model for what evangelism and discipleship ought to look like because we don't just talk to people. We don't just preach to people. We don't just utter empty words. We don't just give Bible studies, but God has called us to reach out and reach down to touch the hurting and meet their needs, to listen to their problems, engage them in conversation, determine their challenges and the hurdles they've got to overcome because real ministry meets people where they are. Real ministry hears their pleas and sees their needs and then responds to the needy in a personal way. In other words, discipleship requires personal investment. It calls for putting yourself at risk and engaging people. Notice it was only after Peter touched a man that he received strength to get up. Acts 3 and 7, the Bible says, and immediately... His feet and ankle bones receive strength. In other words, church, Peter becomes the agent for the outpour of God's spirit because when he reached out to that beggar, when he dared to touch him, the power of Jesus spilled over, bringing healing to this beggar. And the Bible says immediately his feet and ankle bones receive strength. And ladies and gentlemen, we all say we want people to come to know the Lord. We want people to become part of God's church. Well, I hear God saying, reach out and reach down. And look at what happens to the man after he's received ministry. Uh, Acts 3, verse 8. And he leaping stood up and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Y'all missed that. The Bible says, and he leaping stood up. Okay, Elder Davis, uh, the folk are missing the syntax in the text because he didn't get up and then started leaping, uh, but he leapingly stood. I promise I'm in the word of God. He leapingly stood. He leapingly, y'all, y'all, y'all still ain't feeling me. He, he leapingly stood. He stood to his feet, leaping up. Uh, 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 ladies and gentlemen, y'all, y'all still not here with me. Uh, uh, he was laying down on the ground, but when he received ministry, uh, he leapingly stood uh, and he entered with them. You see, they didn't have to invite him. They didn't have to ask him to come along. They didn't have to ask him to become a member of the church. They didn't have to ask him to participate in ministry. They didn't try to force him into the baptismal pool because once he received ministry, uh, he leapingly stood, the Bible says, and he entered into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. You want to know why we can't get folk to join our churches? It's because we have not touched them. Notice that Peter and John didn't have to invite him. But when he was touched and when he was healed, he willingly and voluntarily followed them. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, watch this. He did not get a hand out. Silver and gold have I none. But he got a hand up. Rise up and walk. Elder Davis, you, you, you ought to be shouting right here because he did not get a hand out. Uh, silver and gold, Desmond, have I none. But he got a hand up. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can you see the man transformed? Uh, 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 Des, he, he went from lame to leaping. Uh, he went from destitute to dancing. Uh, 
He went from paralytic to praise leading. He went from begging of alms to the singing of psalms. He went from down on his luck and out of circulation to up on his feet and in the congregation. I can hear him singing, Pastor Laguerre. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. He's singing now, church. Something happened. And now I know he touched me and he made me whole. As I prepare to sign off the broadcast, I'm looking at the passage, Sister Linton, one more time. And this time, I'm trying to place myself in the story. Uh, uh, work with me now. Uh, 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 I'm looking at the passage one more time, Elder Laguerre and Sister Laguerre, and I'm trying to place myself in the story. Uh, I, I told us that we ought to be like Peter and John. Uh, I asked us, beloved, to hear the cries of the destitute. Uh, I asked us to hear the cries of those who are living without Christ and are headed to a Christless grave. By the way, a destitute also include, includes those who have it all but don't know Jesus. Because if you got everything and you don't know Jesus, you ain't got nothing. <clears throat> Looking at this text, Pastor Laguerre, I want to identify with Peter and John who gave the man a hand up instead of a hand out. But if I'm going to be honest today, identifying with Peter and John is a huge mistake. We might wish that we acted like them. But when we look at this story through the lens of salvation history, you and I are disqualified from sitting in the seat of benevolence. The truth of the matter is, church, the truth of the matter is, Mount Vernon, we are more like the beggar than we care to realize. Many of us, are on the inside what the beggar was on the outside. I know it's hard when you look at the parking lot at Mount Vernon to think of yourself as a beggar. It's hard when you look at your bank account to think of yourself as a beggar. When it's hard when you look at the alphabets behind your name. It's hard to think of yourself as a beggar, but you and I must identify with the beggar because like this beggar, amen, uh, 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 we were born with a debilitating condition. The Bible tells us he was born with a condition that placed him at the gate. He came out of the womb with a debilitating condition. Well, you and I too came out of the womb with a debilitating condition and it is called sin. And Elder Davis, if the temple represents the kingdom of God, then you and I were beggars. You and I were aliens and enemies of God. We sat on the outside looking in. We were sick, infected, and contaminated. Uh, the stench and the filth of our iniquities made us unacceptable to God. We, you and I, had given up all hope for a cure because we were under judgment and condemnation, going to hell in a handbasket, begging at the door of the kingdom for some scraps from the Lord's table. You, you and I, from the pulpit to the pew, were desperate for help. And if the beggar cried out for alms, you and I, Elder Lenny, we cried out for grace. And so there we were, church, helpless and hopeless. No prospect for a better tomorrow. No way out, Elder Davis. Broken beneath the yoke of bondage. Held hostage by our iniquities and transgressions. Oppressed under the tyranny of demonic domination and satanic supremacy. We fell and we could not get up. Ah, church, but when all hope seemed gone, when we had surrendered the possibility of deliverance, then came Jesus. Have I got a witness here? Galatians 4, 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy on this Sabbath morning to report that Jesus refused to stay seated on the lofty perch of his heavenly home, lamenting about the sin into which we had fallen. He refused to relegate himself to the praise of unfallen worlds while we remain stricken with the seemingly irreversible condition. He would not stand idly by and watch Satan terrify, torment, and torture us. Jesus had to do something. Now, church, get this. He could have waited for us to destroy ourselves. He could have removed our ability to make bad decisions. He could have chosen to destroy Adam and Eve and start again. He could have exercised his mighty power and with just one thought, remove the entire mess that we made in Eden. But I'm glad to report he didn't do any of that. Instead, the biblical record informs us that he chose the most difficult he chose the most challenging. He chose the most degrading path at his disposal. John tells us that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He became a human being. In other words, Jesus touched us by becoming one of us. He became what we are so that we can become what he is. Somebody said he looked beyond our faults and saw our needs. He lifted us. Can I preach it like I feel it here, Elder Desmond? Jesus said, they don't need a handout. They need a hand up. Oh, Mount Vernon Church, it was not a handout. It was a hand up. Let me see if I can help the church as I bring it to a close. If Jesus had left our salvation to the Ten Commandment law, that would have been a handout. If he relegated it to Abel's sacrifice, that would have been a handout. If he had entrusted it to Moses' staff, that would have been a handout. If he placed my salvation in the hands of Joshua's military ability, that would have been a handout. If he placed our salvation on Samson's bulging biceps, that would have been a handout. Had he put it in David's slingshot or Gideon's sword, that would have been a handout. But I'm so glad to report that he refused to give us a handout. Jesus gave us a hand up, but he was wounded for our transgressions. That's a hand up. He was bruised for our iniquities. That is a hand up. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. That is a hand up. And with his strength, we are healed. That is a hand up. By grace, are you saved through faith? That is a hand up. And that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. That is a hand up. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling. That's a hand up. For God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. That's a hand up. And my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. That is a hand up. He that begun the good work in you is able to perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. That's a hand up. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a hand up. I don't know about you, but I thank God for lifting us up. That's why the songwriter said, I'm pressing on the upward away new heights I'm gaining every day I wish I was in church today still praying as I onward bound I plant my feet on higher ground ladies and gentlemen you ought to pause right here and give God the praise it's not a handout it's a hand up you ought to give God some glory it's not a handout but it's a hand up can you just praise the Lord with me uh, and tell him, thank you, God. You didn't give me a hand out, but you gave me a hand up. Have I got a witness here today? Not a hand out, but a hand up. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. 
because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds my future, life is worth the living because he lives. Church, celebrate with me the fact that Jesus didn't give us a handout, but he gave us a hand up. And so today, we can't sit idly by on the sidelines of what's going on in the world. Just telling folk, don't worry, Jesus is coming again. No, we gotta speak up on behalf of George Floyd and Tamir Rice and Sandra Bland and Alton Sterling and Filio Cast Fili uh, Castile, excuse me, Philando Castile. We gotta speak up on behalf of those who are marginalized. We gotta speak up on behalf, speak up on behalf of the women in our church who still cannot receive ordination from the denomination. We gotta speak up, ladies and gentlemen, when white men commit gross acts of violence and are exonerated and black men who commit the same acts are incarcerated for time and eternity. We gotta speak up against racial injustice, economic inequality. We gotta speak up, ladies and gentlemen, when those who are dealing with their sexual identity issues are marginalized. When the transgenders are treated inhuman, we gotta speak up about those things. Because if Jesus looked beyond our faults, if Jesus didn't give us a hand up, but gave us a hand up, then I declare you and I are under mandate from heaven to do the same. I wanna close this message by declaring something that the Lord has revealed to me over the course of my ministry, and especially during the last few months. Too much of our focus in terms of holiness and godliness centers around personal piety, of which the Lord did not spend much time in the Bible talking about. Most of Jesus's ministry centered, centered around corporate equity. And I declare to you that the truest demonstration of righteousness and holiness is not how you keep the commandments perfectly and how you pray religiously and how you study the word fervently. It is how you deal with the least of these. It is how your personal piety translate into corporate righteousness. It is how the character of God is reproduced in your life and through your life, others come to know God and to give him the glory. I heard Jesus say, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. And I believe, church, that God is calling the Mount Vernon Church to move beyond personal piety and to be an agent of change in our community, sharing the love of God and the gift of grace in Christ to the world. Eyes are closed and heads are bowed. Father God, in the name of Jesus, this word has come to encourage us and to challenge us at the same time. Father, we're so glad that Peter and John gave the beggar a hand up and not just a hand out. But Father, we too realize that we cannot be satisfied by just giving handouts. You've got to become engaged civically, oh God, and give people a hand up. How can we be doing well economically, individually as church members and members of the Mount Vernon community steeped in poverty? Give us a vision, oh God, to transform the lot of those who do not have the blessing that we have. Father, we have many professionals in our church, from the pulpit to the pew, learned men and women. But God, there are people, young people, <clears throat> in the city of Mount Vernon who may never get an opportunity to go to school. Lord, who, who are susceptible to the drug culture and gang violence, I pray, Father God, that you would give us a heart for the hurting. Stretch our ministry, oh God. We've already begun to do some good things. We have some things in place, but in light of what's going on in the world, Father God, give us a hunger for more, to speak truth to power, 
Father, help us to stop being people who are focused on times and dates and to be the true prophetic people of the Bible, to do like the prophets of old and decry injustice in the world. Thank you for this word. May the preacher and the people be animated by what you have declared over us today. Give us a hunger and a thirst for true righteousness to move beyond, Lord God, our personal piety, praying and singing individually and abstaining from sexual immorality and others to the focus, oh God, of seeing your love and grace reproduced and disseminated to the world. Bless every member of our congregation from the oldest to the youngest. May we all be about the business of the kingdom. And for those of you who have received this word today <clears throat> and who want to become engaged in the work of gospel ministry, we invite you to reach out to the Mount Vernon Church. We are preparing even now for when we'll be back in our building, when we'll be back gathered together and mobilized to do the work of going out into the world. Post COVID, we've got to be more intentional about ministry than we've ever been because truly it is time for the Lord to come. And so Father God, bless every individual who has responded in their heart and will respond physically to this word, who will make moves to become a part of the solution and not of the problem. Bless every member under the sound of my hearing and those who ventured onto our site today. We pray that your spirit will rest and abide with us, that this word will be sealed in our hearts is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen.